I got a phone call years ago that is the dream phone call any private pilot ever could get. It came from Williams Air Force Base, where the William Airport is now. Busiest airport in the world. It was their chief training center. And it was the public information officer, and he said, the colonel of the base has heard you talk about flying on the radio. would like to take you for a jet ride in his jet. And you talk about a kid in a candy store. So I went over there. And I had to go through ejection seat training. You had to wear a, you know, you, because you have to learn, you pull up and there's 25 Gs and if, you, if you're bent over, you can break your back. You have to have your back straight. And you go through this whole thing and have a pressurized suit. Right before we take off, the pilot said to me, now you know, if we have a problem, I'm gonna say bail out, bail out, bail out, three times. And I said to him, because it was so, Bizarre. I said, well, what if you're kidding? He says, well, here, because here's what's going to happen. I'll go bail out, bail out, bail out. The third time I say that, I'm gone. You're going to be in this missile with no engine. So you better bail out when I say the third time. I said, oh, see, we never kid about that. So we want to bring up our next uh, speaker, Lieutenant Mike Wald, United States Naval Reserve. And Lieutenant Wald is a volunteer with the Arizona Regional Coordinator for the Institute for a very important thing, Healing of Memories, where he coordinates weekend Healing of Memories workshops for veterans and even first responders who are traumatized by some of the emergency calls they go on. He's a U.S. Navy veteran having served off the coast of Vietnam on board the USS Chemung. I hope I said that right. Uh, and that's uh, an oiler. They come up to a ship when it's leaving Vietnam, they fire a cable across and, and rig lines and they, they refuel the ships and they, they have pallets that come off on cables. It's pretty neat to see. I had that, I saw that when I was leaving Da Nang Harbor in Vietnam, they had an oiler come up. And it's an amazing orchestration, a choreography of ships. They're both going underway and they're firing these cables back and forth. And he, I'm sure he can tell us a lot more about that. He was a U.S. Navy uh, officer in Vietnam, served off the coast. And he's an active member today for the Franciscan Renewal Center, their veteran ministry. He's also co-leader of the Arizona Coalition for Military Families Be Connected Faith Network. That's an organization, by the way, that equips faith communities in Arizona and enhances their support of service members and veterans and their families. Mike served as a U.S. Navy veteran who assisted in the Veteran Memorial Project in Carefree. Lieutenant Mike Wold. Thank you, Preston. Uh, I'm going to discuss a question that I'm sure many vets, including those in this audience, have asked themselves. Were the sacrifices we made worth making? I'm, I'm sure this is especially true for those vets who sacrificed a lot more than I did and lost even more friends and relatives than I did. We say from the start, I know that every veteran has to come to the answer to that question on their own. All I hope to do with this talk today is to give my, bro my veteran brothers and sisters maybe a little different perspective on that question. I've been thinking about that question for many years after I left the Navy in 1970 when an incident occurred which had a big impact on my, on my thinking. About 10 years ago, I was uh, standing in line to get my car fixed. I turned around, and this is up in St. Paul, Minnesota, I turned around and there was a Vietnamese man there. And I mentioned, you know, I had been to Vietnam, I had been in the Navy there, and he started crying. He, oh, his, he just had tears in his eyes. And he said, he grabbed my hands, and he squeezed them really hard. He said, thank you for saving my life twice. I said, well, how did I do that? 1955, our family was in North Vietnam. I was about five years old and the American Navy came up and rescued us and brought us down to South Vietnam. 20 years later, he came, he uh, said, we were on a boat off the coast of Vietnam and an American carrier came up and pulled us aboard. I knew the, I knew the communications officer on one of those ships and they, there were thousands that were rescued through that. Um, you know, I started conversing with him and, and talking about it. Um, and he, what I really, I did a little bit of research and found out that there were 800,000 boat people 
from 1975 to 1995, and that 200,000 to 400,000 perished at sea. So you think they might have had some fire to have a, to be in a free country? So at any rate, um, he and his family invited me to a Vietnamese um, lunch, and if you've ever had a Vietnamese lunch, it's outstanding. Uh, but afterwards, uh, he, he mentioned, he said, by the way, I couldn't learn the language too well, so I'm working three jobs, but my wife learned the language. She's an interpreter for the Minnesota Department of Health and Human Services. So he said, would you like to see the pictures of my kids? So we walked into another room, there's his pictures, and he said, here's my son. He's a thoracic surgeon at uh, University of San Francisco Medical Center. And this is my daughter. She's working for this prestigious law firm in Minneapolis. And then this is our other daughter. She is at, she's in uh, nursing school at the University of Minnesota. She's going to be a great nurse someday. Well, I, I, had, I thought about that a lot. Um, in fact, not only that, but we were members of the same church by coincidence. By the way, the other coincidence was this, this was Veterans Day, the day he invited me. I don't even think he realized that, but quite a coincidence. Every time he saw me, he'd walk by my pew and he would bow to me. He was so thankful for what the American Navy had done. This experience got me thinking. Okay, the wars in our country have been um, motivated by a complex set of reasons. Fill in the blanks, economic, national defense, political. But when you think back over all the wars we've been in, there's a common thread. That common thread is desire to give people the freedom that we, uh, that we enjoy ourselves. Um, usually we're going against totalitarian dictatorships and things like that. It started with the Revolutionary War. We were, getting, we were going up against King George at that time. Now, this country was never about taking over countries. Colin Powell, whom I got a chance to, to, uh, to see one of his talks, God rest his soul, he said something that always stuck with me. He said, when we come into your country, the only land that we ask is a little small plot of land to bury our dead service members. If you think back, you know, we, have, it is, we weren't, we weren't uh, colonizing and doing things like that. I started thinking back at the wars. Our family suffered quite a bit of sacrifice. I lost an uncle. We had two that were had PTSD and treated, spent their whole lives as alcohol, you know, alcoholics. But you know, when you think about World War II and Korea, they actually were successful in, in giving a lot of people freedom. Well, if you look at Vietnam and now Afghanistan, I guess you have to admit we weren't as successful. Uh, we couldn't provide all of them freedom. But the question I'm going to ask my fellow veterans, does that mean she, we should not have tried? Does that mean we should never do this again? I know that you're going to have to answer that question for yourselves. It's a complex question. But when I think about the story about my Vietnamese friend, his name was Chung Huang, who was so grateful to me and the Navy for giving him his freedom, I'm thinking it might have been worth it. But again, I'm going to leave it as an open question. Thank you. Thank you, Lieutenant. Thank you very much.